Hills and Valleys is a podcast that uncovers stories from leaders in healthcare, tech, and everything in between. Straight from the heart of Silicon Valley, we give you a look at the good, the bad, and the future, one episode at a time. Brought to you by Petro Medical. Hey everyone, Omar M. Khatib, Director of Growth here at Petro Medical with another great episode of Hills and Valleys. This is a very interesting one that we recorded with Dr. Jorvi Perry. Uh, we caught up with him at the Society of Cardiac Anesthesiology in Chicago this year, and he spoke about this topic which I've never heard anybody speak about, which was how physicians can start utilizing more of their intuition to guide decisions with technology such as robotics and AI. See, with all the technology that's coming into play, it's freeing physicians up to stop doing so many monotonous tasks and focus on going back to the bedside and focusing on the patient. And Dr. Perry believes that this is one way to start regaining that ability to use intuition in clinical decision making and coupling it with data and technology. Now let me give you a little background on him. So Dr. Perry is the Chief of Cardiothoracic Anesthesia at the University of Minnesota Medical Center in Minneapolis. He completed his training and subspecialty training in cardiothoracic anesthesiology at Brigham and Women's Hospital and Harvard Medical School of Medicine, where he also went on to receive a master's in clinical and translational research. His current professional focus is understanding what happens at the intersection of human behavior and complex systems, such as what we find in the cardiac operating rooms, and how it impacts professional satisfaction and well-being of the physician and the safety and clinical outcomes of the patient. Now, as I mentioned before, this year we talked to him in Chicago, where he delivered a talk entitled, Art to Automation, Reclaiming Our Presence and Intuition in the Operating Room, with the aim of shedding light on the complexities of adequately caring for critically ill patients in the current uh, clinical setting, and elevating the conversation around how physicians might leverage existing and incoming technology in ways that might augment the performance of clinical care teams. Now, Dr. Perry is always looking for value-added conversations with anyone, medical or not, and that might add a perspective on this very relevant and timely issue. So he can be reached or followed through Twitter at T-E Perry M-D. That's T-E-P-E-R-R-Y M-D. So with, without further ado, We'll jump right into the episode. So here is our conversation with Dr. Jorvi Perry. Hi, everyone. This is Omar M. Khatib, a director of growth over at Petrero Medical, and I'm at the Society of Cardiac Anesthesiology here in Chicago, and I'm joined with Dr. Perry. Dr. Perry, thanks for joining us today. Yeah, nice to be here. Fantastic. Yeah, it's been a quite an interesting conference, and you had a really interesting uh, lecture and session the other day. But before we get into that, you know, we wanted to kind of get into... Uh, your background and what brought you into medicine. So to tell us a little about yourself. Yeah, I, um, I did my medical su- school training in Iceland. Um, that's where I'm from originally. Um, my father was in medicine uh, and I kind of followed in his footsteps and, um, and went into medicine myself. I um, did, uh, after my m- medical school, um, be- because I'm a foreign medical graduate, I, I wanted to get into the best residency and fellowship and, and have the best training I could. And so I committed myself to about three years of research um, training or, f- or f- a research fellowship between med school and mm. and my ultimately went into anesthesia. What kind of uh, research did you do? Well, it was interesting. Uh, it was, I knew I wanted uh, to do something with the heart. Uh, and at the time I, I knew of a guy who was doing, was into tissue engineering. and so this regenerative organ medicine uh, that, that he was doing in a lot of, and, and there was a community uh, of that, mostly, it was a big hub in, in Massachusetts, in Boston. And so I ended up working for a cardiac uh, surgeon, a congenital cardiac surgeon, uh, who was tissue engineering heart valves. Um, and he had a lab, he had a, he had, he was a, he had a grant to do these things. And um, so we, so I joined his lab for about three years, and we, we did some f- really fun stuff. So we were, um, we had a really, we had a, it was, I think it was one of my first papers, uh, and um, it was making blood vessels. We, we put them in sheep, 
uh, and then we took them out, look at, looked at them, and looked at the histology and the rheology and and and, um, and those kinds of things. We ended up making a um, a lot of the work was around making heart valves, and these for, were for pediatric patients who um, sometimes are born with um, pulmonary valves that are either atretic or closed or, or whatever. So they're replaced, but these these and they're replaced for pretty early on in life. So within a couple weeks of, of life, and so a, as you might imagine, um, traditionally they get biomechanical valves, and those valves don't grow with the patient. And so the idea was to develop a valve, a tissue engineered valve that would grow along with the, with that baby, so that baby wouldn't have to come back for additional operations. So we we developed scaffolding um, that was biodegradable. Um, we found cells that we could seed onto the scaffold, uh, and then, as as you might imagine, that that tissue would grow as the as that scaffold disappeared, and then you have basically a t a, a tissue valve. Um, we we um, we looked at a few different cell types. We we got stem cells from bone marrow. Um, I mean, it was it was it was it was a long time ago, but it was very cool work. Um, it must have been very exciting, especially, you know, that kind of work is exciting now, but doing that a long time ago, it's, it's yeah. you kind of feel it was like... right at the beginning yeah. of all that stuff. Um, but, but we ended up making valves, so we, so the, the, the scenario was we, we took bone marrow out of um, sheep, and then we grew the cell, the valve, and then we put that valve back into that same sheep, mm. and took them out, you know, uh, a few months at least. Uh, and then looked at the histology. And it was interesting to see, you know, what, once you put a, that valve in and it's subject to all the pressures and the flows, it starts to take on, histologically, it starts to take on um, a lot of the structure of a, of a normal heart valve. Interesting. Yeah, it's fascinating, fascinating stuff. Yeah, yeah, very fascinating. But it got, you know, it really got me into, you know, the, the it got me to understand research me methodology and it got me to understand how, how to ask questions and what's viable and um, you know where, where are the barriers? How do you build teams? I mean, a, lo a lot of these things that I still use today. What was the most memorable lesson that you got out of that kind of experience? Um, that's a great question. I I would say it takes a certain work ethic and a commitment. Um, you're because you it was translational work, so you're you're dealing with um, and in, in, the, in that lab it was it was almost basic research all, all the way to you know bedside for a sheep um, so uh, you know you had to be when you're growing cells and you're seeding these valves you that kind of came first um, and I'm, I'm sure my wife felt that <laughs> at times <laughs> but um, I mean there's a there's a certain commitment and a certain intensity that that you have to bring short term and long term to see something like that through um, and that's you know I, I, for better or for worse, I you know I felt that and I take that with me. Interesting. Yeah. Now, I, one other question. I'm very curious to, to hear you. So you mentioned that your father was a physician. Yep. Um, and you father so my my father was a physician as well. He's a he was a surgeon. But you know when you were younger, um, what was it about medicine that made you want to go into it? And then as you got older, as a young man, what made you sort of commit to go, keep going into medicine? Well, that's a good question. I, um, my dad's a, a um, he's a pediatric cardiologist, uh, and he is, he's an inter he's an interventionalist, um, and he was working at a time in the '80s where uh, Boston Children's Hospital was doing some amazing work for these kids that were born with tetralogy of Fallot and atretic aortic uh, or um, pulmonary valves and. Um, and, and ASDs and VSDs, and they were they were moving from doing you know taking care of these patients um, surgically to a, a, a catheter-based um, interventional therapy. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I had an opportunity in high school to work as a technician in the cath lab, uh, and to see the level of commitment um, from those physicians and nurses and surgeons um, was uh, profound for me um, and I it was you know I could s I could see that they had purpose and it was 
you know, it took me a while to get there, obviously, because you're young and stupid. But um, I could see that that kind of purpose was was super meaningful. Mm -hmm. um, and I ended up, I mean, I went and I, I dabbled in business initially, undergraduate and stuff. And I just wasn't, it just, I just wasn't feeling it. And, um, and so I did what I had to do to get into medicine. Yeah, I know that's a very understandable. I think that I can say this for, for many of us, both, you know, uh, for healthcare professionals and those of, an, uh, of us in industry that we get into this, you know, field because it's, it's a very noble calling, you know, and it yeah. takes, it takes a lot of, I guess, pun intended, it takes a lot of heart, but a lot of persistence and consistency to fail and figure out, like, not only what, what works, but what's going to be ultimately best for the patient. Yeah. So. I want to. I'll do. I'll put in a plug though for oh, please. For, for wellness. <laughs> yeah, yeah, please. <laughs> what I was seeing back in the '80s and, and their level of commitment was three standard deviations away from what's good for the provider. Um, they it was night and day uh, that they spent taking care of these patients, and and if you don't take care of yourself, uh, that you you know you're gonna you're gonna go down in flames. And I think we're seeing that. Interesting, you know, and that's a very interesting concept because. Um, you know, there's a ver it's a multivariate problem, but you know, physician burnout is an all-time high, and a very ugly and dark part of that is that you know, physician suicide rates are very yeah. high, yeah. and you know, I think there's this um, archetype in medicine about physicians, nurses really putting themselves in harm's way, losing losing sleep, not th taking themselves well because they want to sacrifice to the patient. But yeah. you you said something very interesting that. You s so your your point is that you have to f take care of yourself first before the patient. Keep tell tell me a little bit more about that. Yeah, well, w when I was little, I was I used to fly back and forth from Iceland uh, all the time. We I had, so my dad's American, my my mom's Icelandic, and you know from the time I was three up, we we would travel back and forth, and um, and almost every time, um, you know the the stewardesses would. The, the, you know the oxygen would drop out of the of the thing of the uh, you know the top mm -hmm. and it's and they'd say they'd be very clear about they want the parent to put the, the oxygen on first you know and then they can and then take care of the the child and that never that never made sense to me um, what why as a parent wouldn't you first put the oxygen on your kid um, and that it wasn't until recently that I understood, you know, the significance of that, right? It's so if you're if you can't t if you're if you can't take care of yourself, um, you're not going to be take able to take care of people around you. Um, and I've I've heard that metaphor um, used, um, you know, a number of times. But uh, it, it reminded me how confused how confused I was at the time uh, that you, that you w that parents would do that. And I, and I think if you grow up in an environment where you see the physician and the nurses completely focused on the patient with with no regard for themselves uh, then you that's then that's what you emulate mm -hmm. um, and it's it's I think it's healthy for this generation coming into medicine to hear from people who have been through this go take care of yourself go, go figure out a a self-care plan that's a real self-care plan mm. it, it's not don't go to the gym and try to be you know your last dead lift or something right that's not self-care it's it's being intentional about you know sitting with yourself and and, and um, understanding what you're going through and admitting that some of it's hard and some of it's fun um, and until you do that I, I think um, you're at more risk than than less risk of Anxiety, depression, uh, burnout, um, imposter syndrome, um, and you know suicide. Right, right. Do you feel that you know maybe this culture in medicine and part of it, it's sort of worn as a badge of honor. But you know, I guess before you become a physician, you have to sort of uh, walk through the fires of hell in <laughs> training. Um, and do you think that some of this is? is adopted in terms of how difficult and hard training is and as a result physicians just, just turn around and do the same thing to themselves and say yeah. feel that it's just normal but it's not I think so it's you know it's it's it, the fish that can't see the water around them mm. um, and I think it's up to us to to take up to pause and pivot it's a great opportunity you know we're all I mean it, the conversation we're having even at, even at the societal levels is is geared towards you know, taking care of the provider so that the provider can take care of the
the patients. Um, and these are these are models that we're seeing in institutions too. Well, you know, and that's a good sort of jumping off point to to, to your session. So, you know, I, I want to start by asking this question that you you um, addressed yesterday. In talk where where are we right now in medicine? Well, I, c I can speak from where we are in cardiac anesthesia, and and predominantly in in the operating rooms, um, and a little bit in in the ICUs. Although I don't, you know, I I take my patients up there and I check on them there, but I don't work in that environment. But it looks a lot like the operating rooms. Um, I th I think it's um, we're at a place where uh, there's a real imbalance between why we got into medicine or why we think we got into medicine and what we're actually doing day to day. Um, and what I mean by that is, uh, you know, I, th I think, you know, you commit to medicine. I mean, l let's assume that, you know, th that we're, we're highly driven, we're type A, we like to win and, s and then succeed, and um, we like affirmation and all that. But, but if you stay in medicine, it's, it's probably because you have a willingness um, to, or an ability to care deeply for, you know, your fellow man, and you'd like to see them get through X, Y, and Z. Um, and then what we're what's happening is that that has been set aside, not, maybe not intentionally, but because we are now, the the complexities of care have become so great that if we don't do all those tasks that we need to do to get through the day, um, we know that the patient will suffer. Mm. We're not totally sure if 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 empathy is going to get them through, through the day, but I know that if I don't do X, Y, and Z in terms of tasks, the patient definitely will not get through the day. So I think we're, we're, we're almost, we're almost, it's a bit of a gamble, but we're willing to sacrifice some of that care and empathy that we got into it for the first place to make sure that stuff gets done. And so, um, you know, and that's happened very quickly. And I, I think it's happened, um, I mean, there are different reasons why it's happened. I, I think we're in an age where um, we're seeing um, a lot of technology, both hardware and software, coming into the operating rooms and hospitals. Um, I think we're we're at a, at a crossroads where we're seeing sicker and sicker patients, older and older. Um, and I think you know physicians are in a unique position because the ratio between physicians and non-physicians that surround that patient have never been higher. So it used to be I showed a I showed a picture in. In my talk yesterday, it was one of the first pictures. It's a, it's a painting. I think it's called the physician, but it was it was this it was a it was a physician that was sitting with a patient, and th there was no care team, right? And he probably got there by horse and buggy, you know. And it was just that it was just that physician and, and that patient. If you go into an operating room now, there there are five disciplines that are, that are actively working, um, and um, and two two of those are f are you know physicians, um, but th that ratio is getting le and less and less. And so what you know kind of what is our what is our role? There's a bit of an identity crisis, you know. Mm. Especially, I mean, you, you know, I think we see this between anesthesiologists and CRNAs. Like who who you know what's the difference in the quality of care? And you know, I know it's contentious and. Um, a, and a hard thing to talk about because you're talking about your livelihood and and there's a lot of uh, um, sunk cost bias and you know all this stuff that you put your time and effort into and and here comes another profession that can do the same thing as you um, it's possible it's possible mm. and I think we have to to look at that and sit with it and talk about it mm. you know and you you said something right now that was very interesting you said it, there's a uh a change in identity. Um, one thing that uh, I've noticed in speaking to these to different physicians, and someone, uh, Dr. Gordon Morewood, yesterday when I was speaking to them, pointed this out that you know a few decades ago there weren't as many different technologies, there weren't as many different you know diseases, comorbidities, but it seems that as we've developed these new technologies, yep. there's been an explosion of it. Kind of like when maybe a few centuries ago someone uh, first looked through a microscope and realized this water droplet had millions of organisms in it. Yeah. And so 
in doing that, it seems that there's almost an, an overwhelming amount of things to deal with, to look at. And something in that painting you showed yesterday that really struck me was that the physician was very intently and intensely yeah. focusing on the patient. Yes. And I don't think that we see that too often today because yeah. physicians are spending more time with with technology is that does that is that correct in saying that? Yeah, and so the the picture I con contrasted that with was a was a picture of the operating room, uh, the where where we stand in anesthesia, and it it was just a it was just chaotic, uh, with monitors and drug delivery systems and you know there's an echo machine in there and there's I mean there's just, um, I would I would. I would venture to guess that the the public has no idea of what that looks like, and I, I'm I would be a little hesitant in showing them like this. This is our workspace, um, and and my point with this, and and I and I this should hit home with a, a lot of anesthesiologists is that um, because we've been flooded with technology in in ways that haven't necessarily been as in is intelligent and and uh, that's not to put anybody down it's just it hasn't been it it doesn't seem very intentional the way we develop and introduce technology and so what you get as a result is you know we have we have f you know up to um, 40 bits of information on one screen times three four five screens um, you're talking about h hundreds of bits of information, and if you can imagine, there's no depth to that information. So, um, so I'm obligated to look at at 100 bits of data all of the time. So, and what I mean by depth is, um, if there's a if, if there's a bit of information that's not important, it's not pertinent at the time, it still shows up. Uh, it, it, if we could develop um, technology that gives me information in through any one of my senses, uh, but it does it in an intelligent way where I can tell the difference between what's important and, and what's not important. Now we're now we're getting at um, now we're getting at an automated way for me to uh, take in information, interpret it, and then deliver the right kind of care. Versus right now, it's just it's a constant flow of information and. Right. For one, I mean, forget about physicians. Human beings are not used to, from an evolutionary yeah. standpoint, right. digesting and dealing with all these types of information. And especially as human beings, we all have different biases. Yeah. And so what might be uh, important That's for exactly you right. is going to be different from someone else. Right. And not because one's right and one's wrong, but again, different training, cultures, biases, yeah. patients. Absolutely. So yeah. is there, you know, so you describe a very sort of task-centric world um, and in your talk yesterday which uh, I mean it was a packed house a lot of people really enjoyed it and I feel like yeah. you could drop you can, you can hear a pin drop in there okay, you talked about moving away from a task-centric world and somehow empowering the physicians intuition so tell me a yeah, more I, about I, that. I mean this gets into wellness um, that was my so I did a lot of reading on on this subject and you know when I proposed this a year ago I didn't, I don't think I fully grasped the, the magnitude of this topic. And it can go in so many directions. And um, so, I mean, there are, there, are, there are people who have developed um, a career around thinking about these things. Um, but there are also, there's a lot of stuff on the internet that, that is valid, um, but it's, it's kind of mostly opinion. So I, I decided to take, um, I tried to represent um, the perspective, but I but I also felt like at at some point I just felt like I needed to take an opinion on this, mm. on, on why why we need to start thinking more intentionally about automating, um, and so it might have felt more like an editorial uh, than sort of an, a primer or an informational session. But um, um, so, what was your original question? Was so how, you know how how do we move away from a task centric environment? Right. Yeah. So um, it, it 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 occurred to me that as I was contrasting those two pictures of the of the, of the you know the physician si sitting under candlelight 
um, with that patient and the the you know the chaos that we were in it, it occurred to me how what you know what my day looks like and from the time I come in till the time I leave it's 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 basically just getting through things that I need to do doing them in the right order so that the patient makes it through the surgery as effectively and, and efficiently as, as we can get and and there's very little time for just being present um, and that takes um, I have had the opportunity over the last few years to um, to think more about that piece uh, but but it takes a, it takes training outside the operating room to bring that presence back in to, to the operating room um, and kind of um, but you have to you have to start delegating tasks you have to start managing tasks and you have to be very intentional about w what are the tasks that you're going to do mm. you, ca you can't you, it's not necessarily about decreasing them but it's about optimizing right mm. so we spend you know if you really look at our workflow it, it can be very inefficient um, so I've, I've, I've tried in for myself to make my workflow as efficient as, as it can be um, in order to, to optimize the tasks. Uh, and in so doing, I've been able to become, I, I can just feel that I, can, that I have opportunities during the procedure and during my day where I can just be in, in present in the operating room. Interesting. Which is new to me. It's new to me. It sounds like you know. You mentioned earlier. You know, you have, and it, I think this this um, this skill, which which every human being has, but we never yeah. listen to, especially here in the Western world. And I think you know, going through medicine and medical training, you have to learn how to have a lot of confidence because yeah. you're dealing with human life. But somehow the ego creeps into there, and I think that's where you start having to manage all these different data points. But it sounds like because of necessity, you had to learn how to get back your intuition to yeah. feel and understand what's important and what's not. Is, is that correct? Yeah, that's, uh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. When did you first notice this? Uh, I mean, I, I had, I had a, an episode of burnout. Um, and, you know, I, I had the diagnosis. How did you know that you were burned out? <laughs> and I'm asking because so many, so many yeah. physicians out there are yeah. probably burned out, but they yeah. they're ignoring it. So right. Well, you don't it's, mind. It's oh my, yeah. It's different. It's different for everybody, I think. So I and I don't think I'm. It's different for everybody, but I don't think I'm. I'm well, what's the saying? It's one of one of my professors used to say, um, "You're different, but you're no damn special." No, you're you're special, but you're no damn different. Oh, right? that's a good. Yeah, yeah that's a good yeah. one. And and we're I have to all, use that with interns. Yeah, we're all, we're, <laughs> we are all special, but we you know, but we we're not different, right? So um, I I went through um, some changes in my life that put I felt, um, and ultimately it was me who put all this pressure on myself to succeed and to push and you know to to get better and to make the program better and. Um, and the way it manifests for me is, you know, aggression and agitation and frustration mm -hmm. and anger. Mm -hmm. uh, and I see now that the, you know, as angry as I was at other people around me, it, it, it was how I was treating myself. Um, and so, you know, I was, I was my own worst enemy for a while. Um, to the and it was impacting my family. It was impacting my work environment um, to the point where um, you know I just needed I needed a time out. Um, it was it was made clear to me by by people out outside of me um, because I, because I, and I remember distinctly feeling like oh this is it's an interesting discussion about burnout. I, I think I think everybody around me is burned out. And n never did I think, oh, you know, maybe I'm being impacted as well. Um, and it was so it, it it was distinct events that that brought it to my attention to the point where I couldn't uh, ignore it anymore. Um, and that's when I really started becoming intentional about self care and re-examining, you know, what are the things that I want to be doing and how do I want to be doing them and how do I want to be communicating. And that's a you know that's a daily commitment and recommitment, 
Um, you know, I grew up with, and you might identify with this, you know, with, especially in the Western world, as you say, there's a stepwise fashion of getting to places, right? You, you start off on the lowest step. This is the, this totem pole thing that we're always talking about, right? One of the low, low end of the totem pole, high end of the totem pole. But, you know, it, but I found that at least my emotional and spiritual life are, are not like that. It, that my, um, you know, I, I may have, I may be able to draw out, you know, the, the accolades and affirmations that I've gotten in a stepwide fashion. They've gotten more and more um, in, in size and quantity. But, but my emotional and spiritual path go, wavers back and forth. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I'm, sometimes I'm in the dumps, you know, and sometimes I'm not in the dumps. Mm -hmm. But, and that, that changes from day to day. But to be able to, you know, for me, self-care is to be, or, or wellness is to be able to sit with that. Um, whereas before, if I was in the dumps and something wasn't working, head goes down, push through. Interesting. Right? Interesting. You know, so, you know, w what's interesting about your, t about your talk yesterday was that it was a talk about, um, about intuition and automation and technology. Yeah. And you had mentioned you had changed the title many times. Yeah. And you started with one title at the beginning of the talk and you ended with a very interesting one. Can you? Yeah. You yeah. yeah. So, uh, um, the idea was like, how do we get from, how do we get from art, the art of medicine, which is, you know, to the, um, to automation, to mm -hmm. automating everything. And I had this, you know, I had this at a year ago or a year and a half ago, I had this idea that, you know, as we could just automate as much as we possibly could, uh, and that would be cool. Mm -hmm. And then when I started looking at this and really thinking about it and talking to people, the art piece of medicine, is what we're talking about is that is that gut feeling piece it's that like, intuition right yeah it's like you know you've you have that feeling where god i think I'm, i mean i've s i've been here before i you know i there's something's going to happen right now in the or and and i need to be i need to heighten my alerts right mm -hmm. and if you if you can access that then what good is all your experience right you you're going to miss it um, and so the idea is, let's take the mundane stuff. Let's take the repetitive stuff that I didn't go to medical school to think about. Um, and get that off my plate and make room for when something's going to happen, make, make room for an ability to sense that. Mm -hmm. right? And um, I'm, sh I'm sure that most industries have something like that. I'm sure. I'm sure. Financial guys and accounting and you know um, trial lawyers. There's something that they pick up on. There's an energy in the room. Mm -hmm. You know. There's some, there's a body language. There's something that somebody says. We're like, they they think. All right, something's gonna happen here, and I and I know what I know. I think I know what it is. I agree. Yeah. I agree. And you know, it's interesting you mention that. It's it's we kind of joke about it in medicine that. It takes so long to adopt something that's been used for so long in other industries. But you know, if you look at the billionaire Warren Buffett, I mean, he can go through multiple market reports, yeah. investment sheets, and everything. But he always talks about his, you know, how how strong his intuition is. And I think he's in his late 80s or maybe close to his 90s now, and right. it must be very strong. Yeah. And you can't necessarily teach that. Um, do you feel that the explosion of technology, in some way, Let's just look at medicine. These sensors and robotics that that physicians are extending themselves technologically to be better, you know, at sensing and all these things. But the the real importance of this is to sort of get off these, as you say, mundane tasks, so they can focus more on higher level things. No, like I th I think that I think in general, what I've seen anyway is is a general resistance to technology. And I think a lot of the, the if you go into any operating room in the country, I think, you know, 75% of the monitors got there um, despite the physicians. Um, I, I think, um, you know, they either got forced in there by a single stakeholder or, mm -hmm. you know, or, or administration who read something and they wanted that monitor in there. I, I don't, I don't think, I think, I think, my opinion is that physicians are digging their heels in on on all this automate uh, on all this technology. Why? 
Well, I, you know, I, I think you can, if you, if you talk to physicians, I think you'll get, m in many cases, superficial answers, like, um, w it does, I don't believe it, um, I don't think it works. Or um, I don't need it. <laughs> I, don't, I don't need it, I, I've been doing this for long enough. Um, show me the randomized controlled trial. Um, and I think those are all manifestations of something deeper. And I think that's, pri and that's a hard conversation to have. Um, when you're getting into, you know, fear and shame and, and, and intense feelings like that, and, and I don't mean to be dramatic, because if, if you're suggesting to a physician that, that uh, this technology will help you um, manage X, Y, and Z, and then they start using it, and that X, Y, and Z is actually 180 degrees to what they've been doing for the last 20 years, um, it suggests that they've been doing it wrong for 20 years. And the number of patients that th they've impacted in a negative way, I mean, that's, that's a hard thing to sit with and very understandable. Um, but, I, but I think it, I, I think the conversation, and I'm not sure how you get there, I, th I think it probably starts very organically, um, but it's, it's conversations that need to be had um, about w where is this resistance to disruptive technology coming from. Um, it is, I mean, it is autonomy and it is job security and all that stuff, but, but on, on a deeper level, it's a deep-seated fear of being wrong, right? Or, or having done the wrong thing. Um, so that's, that's a, that, that starts, I think, between usually two people. Uh, and then, um, you know, over time it becomes a discussion point and I think we're seeing it more and more in society on the society level I don't know that we're having you know that deep meaningful conversation yet but you see uh, with you know with um, with the increase in in these guidelines uh, mm. development so the other half of guideline development and content development is implementation right and so people were really good at developing content but w but we're not that good at implementing and mm -hmm. in order to implement, and this is the whole basis of implementation science, I mean, it's just, you know, it's, it, it should be a team of psychiatrists that come in and talk about, you know, you know, you need to talk about your mom and, you know, what happened to you <laughs> when you were three uh, in order for you to be able to implement some technology. Um, but, you know, it, it's, it's getting there. Now, when it comes to technology, so like one thing uh, that it's being talked about more these days is the use of artificial intelligence yep. and, and not only in the operating room but let's say with the EMR with a variety of things to gain more insights you know be more quote-unquote efficient yep. um, but the resistance that's there do you feel that it's it's coming from a point of fear or point, a point of shame and let's just say with with cardiac anesthesiologists yep. I think there's a f I think there's a fear I mean there's a um, you know there's skepticism but but um, my sense is that it's it's a skeptic it's a it's a it's a skepticism with with an asterisk. I mean, there's something else going on uh, where uh, physicians are resistant to thinking about these things. Um, now, on a on a very realistic note, I, I mean, uh, in order for you to get into artificial intelligence and machine learning and all these things, you you need enormous data sets. Right, and, and we you need good data. And yeah, it yeah. needs to be good data. And we're just not collecting. We've just recently started collecting data in a format that it can actually be extracted. So, you know, if you read Eric Topol's book, um, Deep Medicine, I, you know, I just I, I think he lays it out pretty fairly. That um, I mean, there are there are pieces of medicine that might lend lend themselves to artificial intelligence, but for the most part, we're we're not we're in the first inning, I mm -hmm. think, on a lot of these things. So, but now's the time to talk about it, right? Now is the time to, and, and, and you know, and, and I'll, j I'll jump, I'll segue into something um, that you were talking about before. It's, it's this, all this technology that's coming into the ORs. Um, we, we've had very little to do with it. Um, and, I, and I think, for, f you know, if you, industry has been good at getting, their, at getting physicians' opinions and you might have some insight on this early on, right? They kind of get they kind of get what the what the 
physician needs and then they go give those blueprints to an engineer the engineer disappears for a couple years and comes out with something that um, doesn't look like what we actually need in the OR um, and I, and that 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 is nobody's fault. Um, if any, if it's anybody's fault, it's physicians' resistance to work with industry. Um, and y you know, you see that at some at some high level places. And physicians are the roadblocks to working with industry are huge. Um, and and but the unintended consequences are we have we have an OR full of. Uh, machinery that <laughs> that nobody wants to use, nobody mm. can use. The interface is silly; um, it's not useful. Um, but if you involve the team uh, f from the beginning, all the way through that process, uh, I think you're going to start seeing way more intelligent technology that we can actually use and will benefit the patient and won't add. It won't add tasks, right? It'll take. It'll. It'll. Um, decrease the number of tasks that we have to do. Absolutely, and that's the whole point of technology. And I think, you know, and maybe maybe I'm, maybe not optimistic, but this is what my belief is uh, with technology, is that in medicine, the real purpose of technology is to help physicians return from whence they came. Mm -hmm. Meaning, almost it's almost an anti-technology thing. It should exist so that you don't deal with it, yeah. and it's one less thing you don't have to worry about, so you can go back maybe to that painting that you showed where yep. you're focusing just on the patient versus playing with this shiny new thing, right. and there's many of them. One thing that I wanted to ask is, you know, I've, uh, coming from a, a company that's focused in, in the ICU, I've seen these photos where it's the ICU in the 80s and the ICU today, yeah. and it hasn't changed. Yeah, it's this stuff. <laughs> stuff, stuff right. Is it the same yeah, thing? It's in, a bag in of urine. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah it's it, yeah, exactly. All that. Yeah. There's wires everywhere. Yep. You know, uh, monitors. There's just so much to look at. Yep. Is it the same? Do you feel like it's the same thing with uh, w you know in in the uh, cardiothoracic uh, suite in, in the operating room between the 80s and now? Yeah. Y yes, I do think that. I mean, nothing's changed in the in the time that I've been in cardiac anesthesia, and you know, sometimes, you know, when I am being present <laughs> in the <laughs> OR, I'm a I'm able to see it, and I think to myself, uh, you know, I wonder what other industry is like this. Like, you know, when you start in finance or you know I investment banking, you know, you start at the bottom. You start. You have a cubicle, you know, and you know you try to clean it up and have it nice but you know it's not a lot of space and then you kind of move up and then at the end of it you're you know you're a CEO and you're in the corner office and you got a view and you know everything's taken care of and it's and it's a beautiful place to to be and work and spend time N none of that has happened in for me I, I, I worked in a piece of shit operating room <laughs> when I was a fellow and I work in a piece of shit operating room now uh, and, and I'm lucky not to, you know, I, I tell my staff sometimes, you know, I'm going to wear a helmet tomorrow because I, this is dangerous, right? <laughs> I mean, I'm, you know, we're tripping over cords, we're, we're you know, monitors behind monitors, um, you know, I can go on and on. It's, it's just the, if you can see it, if you can start to objectify it and, and be, you know, you can see how ridiculous it looks. It really is. Yeah. I was, I was in a case a couple of weeks ago and I, you know, I didn't know where to look because I was looking down to make sure I don't hit a cord, <laughs> but I also have to look up so my head doesn't right. run into anything. Exactly. So it's just yeah. like, you know, yeah. there's a lot going on, yeah. you know, um, and I, you know, I don't, I don't know. I don't know um, how you, how you remedy that. I just, that. I, you know, I, I won, I, I just wonder what the market is, you know, for, for industry to come, I mean, they would have, you know, you get, you get a startup company from, from the Valley who, to come in and say, you know, let's just design this thing. Let's just design an, an OR that looks like an executive suite, a corner office. Um, I just don't know what the market is, right? It's, I, I don't know how big it is. I mean, you know, uh, hospitals in terms of healthcare, I know healthcare industry is the biggest industry we have, but the cardiac operating room is a, is a sliver of that. So, uh, you know, I, the best we can do right now is like to, you know, roll up our cords and make sure they're not on the floor you know, make sure that the monitors are high enough. We're not going to hit hit our heads on them. Um, make sure the, you know, the hallways are clear so we're not getting run over by carts. I mean, um, that's a that's a about all we can do. I haven't seen a lot of solutions. Mm -hmm. And maybe you know, maybe this goes back to what you were mentioning with the use of intuition. That 
maybe we can't get away from it right now in terms of all these machines, all these cords and everything, but yeah. maybe there could be a way to design them so that you only interact with them, with them when you need to, yeah. and 90% of the time, they're out of the way because you don't need to be paying attention right. to them. Yeah, I think that's right. So I, w I would love to see that. That would be that would be nice. Yeah. I have you know we want to be mindful of your time. Yeah. A few questions for you. One that has you know sort of come up. So this is my first time at a cardiac anesthesiology meeting. Yeah. Um, and you know I I talked with a few people yesterday about it and, and you earlier. Um, so one thing I asked a, a physician at. I can't mention the hospital. Let's say it was the it was a chair of, of cardiac anesthesiology at a very well respected, world renowned uh, hospital. And, sure. and I asked him, um, you know, what keeps you up at night? What are some things that keep you up at night? And he mentioned uh, heart failure, bleeding, and acute kidney injury. And acute kidney injury, even me being in med school, we didn't talk about because why talk about something that you can't do much for? Yep. And you know, now you know my company's looking into it. There are a couple of others you know, who have done research and shown the value of urine output, but when you realize that there's a way to address, let's say, a syndrome or disease, acute kidney injury, let's say sepsis is another one, do you feel that most physicians are going to be deep down inside hesitant because it's one more thing to deal with, or what, what's, what do you think that's like when you illuminate a way to deal with something that hasn't been able to be dealt before? Um, I, you know, I, yeah, I think there's going to be skepticism, but I can tell you my experience, um, and I, and I'm, and I've stumbled upon this um, in more recent years. Um, I, I've become, you know, I, I, so after my fellowship, I did, um, I was looking, I was into genetics and we're looking at um, inflammatory markers uh, and genetic predisposition. Predis predisposition to um, adverse cardiac events after bypass and things like that and it wasn't it was it was much more kind of ooh, translational clinical and I've become much more interested in in outcomes um, but as I under starting to understand outcomes research I think you have to go upstream right so there's there's something that drives those outcomes you know you, c you can't just focus on time to extubation right and, and work towards that there's something there's something upstream of that that has that has to be managed or changed or standardized or something um, and, and I'm getting yeah, <laughs> I'm, yeah. I'm taking the long ride around here no we like uh, the long ride yeah. on this show <laughs> trust me um, so uh, acute kidney injury uh, is a manifestation of um, poor Hemodynamic management, mm -hmm. uh, and, and, it's, and I'm, not, I'm not saying people are doing something incorrectly. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm just saying that um, I if it's not ideally managed, and as I mentioned in my talk yesterday, this is a complex system, right? So there are mm -hmm. there are pieces of this system that we don't, we certainly can't see, and some si parts of the system we don't even know exist, right? So there are um, there are pieces of acute kidney injury that we don't quite understand mm -hmm. we don't even have access to but I do think we have a fairly good idea that if you if you don't manage your hemodynamics in a certain way you're you're more or less predisposed to kidney injury after cardiac surgery mm -hmm. um, so in that way I'm interested in, in acute kidney injury because it's an outcome but I can also and I, and I have I have now some expertise in hemodynamic management that's 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 kind of point of care directed in in the cardiac operating room. Mm -hmm. Another big piece is, you know, post-operative cognitive dysfunction. I, right. I saw it as a big topic at this, right. this meeting. And so, so we're starting to understand more and more in recent years that there there's a there's a certain threshold for if you go under hemodynamically, and that that includes blood pressure, includes you know blood volume, um, you know your afterload and all those things, if you go below those things, you're, you're more likely to have s um, some type of cerebral or cognitive dysfunction after surgery. And the same must apply for the kidney. Mm -hmm. um, so we have reasonable, or we're starting to get reasonable, and we're starting to get a, a reasonable look at what um, end organ perfusion of the brain might look like. We have mm -hmm. monitors for that. 
um, we have echo and EKG to see if there's ischemia. And I'm talking about point of care things, right? Mm. Not, not things like, um, all right, let's, let's do a thousand patients where we keep the blood pressure above 65, and then, and then we'll study those patients afterwards and see if there's any cognitive dysfunction. That, that is fine. It's clinical work. It's been done. I, I don't want to see another paper on that. I, I want to see point of care testing where we can react for that patient in the moment. Right? Interesting. And what what you what you're suggesting um, with with what you've described um, with with urine analysis is is point of care testing. I can I can react to that that patient, and that's that's important to me. Interesting. And so. And this is something that, because I, I remember uh, I, was, I was interviewing a nephrologist last year, and I remember seeing this excitement around uh, mobile ultrasound. I said, why are nephrologists getting excited about ultrasound? They kept saying, well, you know, and they call it point, uh, POCUS, uh, uh, point of care ultrasound. Yep. And it seems that the technologies that are bringing the physicians back to the bedside mm -hmm. at point of care yep. is what they're most interested in. Yep. Is that is that am I correct in saying uh, that? Absolutely. Yeah. Why is that? Do you think that it's a subconscious move away from technology and using the right technology to bridge back to the bedside versus being at the computer? Yeah, I mean I think it goes back to that picture, right? We we want to spend time at the bedside. It's why we got into medicine. Um uh, you know, there are very few physicians who have any kind of training in in research. Um, you know, most of those go a different route. They have their own lab. They're doing PhD level work. They're they're chasing grants. Um, they're they're not in the operating room. So, the, you know, those papers might be coming out of a lab that all that clinical research, but um, they're not. I mean, to be completely honest, they're just not that useful for. And I'm going to go on a limb here. I'm going to I'm going to say it, please. <laughs> and yeah, that, and, do and it. That, and that is that, you know, I, and again, I think we do the best we can. But I think we have a we have a, an academics promotion system that incentivizes papers, and so you you see you see people spending time in that clinical research space where they can they can look at X and see if Y changes, write it up, publish it, and then move from assistant to associate to full professor and we don't you know where whereas what we need to be doing is we need to be spending time in that tra transitional space be translating the clinical research that we already know and we're starting to republish and republish and republish to how do we take care of that patient that I'm taking care of tomorrow and that's that that translational space that is that involves uh, the toughest piece of that space is getting humans to do what you think is right. So now you're getting into human factors engineering, you're getting into industrial psychology, um, you're getting into um, how, to, how to interpret large, large data sets, you're getting into IT and legal, um, contracts with industry. Um, these are things that are, make people very uncomfortable and something that you know, we didn't, definitely didn't go to medical school for or get any training in medical school about mm. um, so it's a it's a big leap but I um, you know and may, maybe we we incent maybe we need to as a, as a society to start incentivizing r r efforts that come out of that space and maybe it's not that traditional paper with an introduction and method you know methodology and results and and discussion maybe it's um, implementation efforts you know, I, I don't know what it looks like, but I think it looks different than picking up, uh, than publishing a paper in a journal. Interesting. And this, you know, one idea, uh, uh, there was a talk yesterday with Dr. Gordon Morwood about uh, the business model of medicine and getting yeah, away from the feet. Smart guy. He, he is. Yeah. And I, I learned a lot just sitting in that short time and talking yeah. with him. But he mentioned that the, um, you know, getting away from the fee for service and that we've been incentivized to get paid on process. Yeah. And what should be is product, because if it's just product, the process can be that can be incentivized to be innovative, yep. you know, and, and yeah, change. Yeah. Do you feel like maybe that's what it is that even in the academic world that publishing papers is that you're you're getting rewarded for process and not product? Um, yeah, that's. I mean, that's very possible. Uh, I, I have a hard time um, wrapping my head around that piece because I just, 
at some point I had a stroke where like money <laughs> matters and, and and reimbursement matters and I and I wish I like I wish I had that passion that 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 Gordon does you know about this stuff and uh, that understanding that he has but I and I don't but, um, but you know I but I do understand that I get paid for putting an arterial line in mm -hmm. but I don't get paid for managing the blood pressure for the entire case as hard as that may be mm -hmm. um, do I care about that? I, I, again, I wish I did. Um, and I, and I, and the I wrong think most, most are people do. I, I, right. It, it does have to do with incentives, and I and I recognize that that most people feel. I mean, it's a source of, uh, of being undervalued, right? Um, you know, my grandmother can put an A line in, mm -hmm. but my but I don't know that my grandmother can manage the hemodynamics of an entire cardiac case mm -hmm. that goes on for six or eight hours. Um, so, am I being undervalued? Yeah. I think so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. and we're getting close to time. I want to yeah. be mindful of, of of your time here, but you know, one you know, one or two more questions is, you know, can physicians return to using their intuition, you know, by using using technology better? Do you feel that that's possible? Absolutely. Yeah, and the, you know, this the, over the last year, what I've doing this reading, I, I just I've become more and more convinced that that um, the really good book I read, um, I'd recommend it. Um, Simon Sinek. Uh, Start with why. Start with why. Ah. Yeah. Uh, if you haven't had a chance to read it, I mean, even even if you just glimpse it, take a glimpse at his TED talk, or or I think he's got some talks. And for me, that's the why. Mm -hmm. So what uh, you know, why do you, why do you want all this technology in there? Um, because I don't want to do all the things that this technology can do and do way better than I can. Not that I want to sit back now and do nothing. I, now I want I want to bring forth th those those things in me that I think can really help me get through the day, it can help my colleagues get through the day, um, and it can help our, our patients do better. And it sounds like it's the, the use of technology so that you can use what's in you, which is this intuition, this yeah. energy, yeah. to heal people, which right. sometimes it's looked at this, you know, sort of this, like it's wizardry, yeah. but these are some things that science has still yet been able to explain, yeah. Yeah. right? Yeah, the gut feeling, it's a, it's a real thing. Interesting. Yeah. Last question that you kind of uh, segued into it is um, uh, you, you shared some books, but if you could share some book recommendations with our audience, I'm sure many of them would really appreciate it. Yeah. Um, I just got done reading Essentialism, uh, and the, Gregory McKeon, I can't, I can't remember how to spell it, but um, if, you, if you just Google Essentialism, um, it really it's it's a very cool con it's not it's nothing new but he packages it in a way that um, you know you just allows you to you know he talks about how to say no to things he talks about how to just prioritize you know your your f and focus on what it is that you really want to do um, it's a it's a it's a cool read um, um, the book by Eric Topple is really good deep medicine deep medicine it it looks like it's a big book, but it's you know, he writes so well, and um, you know you can read it in I, I read it in a week, um, and it's it's a resource you can go back to. Um, there's uh, there's another good book by a law duo, a legal duo, brother, um, father, son. Their last names are Suskind and Suskind. Um, they write about professions. And how professions are changing from, you know, craftsmanship to packaging, essentially. Um, and it really it, it opened my eyes to how protective we are, and and the things that we do to protect our own professions, um, when there may not always be a good reason to do that. Um, we, you know, I I see I don't know if it's this binary, but I see that we are digging our heels in on a lot of things um, as opposed to o opening our doors and, and inviting non-physician providers a to participate and for us to maybe teach and counsel and then move on to something else. Um, mm -hmm. So that, yeah, I mean those are, those are kind of, uh, those are kind of the big ones and then you know there are, you know there are meditation books and self-care books that you know, I've gotten gotten to read, and um, Pema Chodron is is one that I pick up. I mean, she has like pamphlet-sized books that 
but they just get really to the core of. Can you recommend one of one of hers? Um, when I think it's called when things when things fall apart. Oh, okay. um, it's a uh, it's a, it's a book that you can read over and over. You'll always get something new out of it. Uh, and and I think that probably speaks to the the journey that we're all on. Like mm -hmm. you, you know, you, you get to a certain point and you you have a certain understanding, you have more experiences. Now you have a different understanding, and mm -hmm. and her words will always, you'll always connect mm -hmm. with her, with her words in different ways. Fantastic. Yeah, Dr. Perry. Hey, it's it's been incredibly uh, yeah, it's fantastic. Been fun. It's been enlightening. Yeah. Now. I'm sure many of our, uh, uh, I was going to say readers, many of our listeners are going to be curious, how can we best uh, find you online? I believe you're pretty active uh, on Twitter. I try to be, yeah. Uh, what's your Twitter handle? Uh, it's uh, T-E Perry M-D. Perfect. We'll yeah. leave that in the show notes. And I then, appreciate it. Uh, any, any, any other social handles or websites that... Not right now. I um, One's I, enough, right? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> um, you know, I'm... My daughter's 22. She's on Instagram, or is that we? Do you say the full thing or IG? I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Instagram, <laughs> Instagram, IG. Yeah. I, I don't know how to use that yet professionally, um, but I think that's a that's a great platform. Um, I work on that one. Okay, on that one. sounds good. Yeah. Hey, thank you again. I appreciate thank you. it. Yeah, thanks a lot. Hi everyone, thanks for tuning in to this episode of Hills and Valleys. If you haven't already, go ahead and hit that subscribe button on our podcast. That way you're notified of new episodes as they're released. And if you're not already, please go ahead and follow Potrero Medical on all our social platforms, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, and YouTube. And we'll see you next time.